Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This is episode number 132 of the Course Ground Podcast with you this evening. Host, creator Sean Rossler. How's it, everyone doing safe and healthy, I hope? You know, these are, by all accounts, very, very strange days we live in. When I think about the show and how many serious notes I've taken lately thanks to COVID, it makes me realize just how much things have truly changed. And then with a name, George Floyd, and two, Breonna Taylor, we've gone from a pandemic like we've never experienced before to a level of racial awareness we've never had to experience before. Well, I should say I've never had to. I know and now know more and better just how many of you have had to. Right up front, before I touch on anything else or go into any kind of line, script, joke, whatever, on behalf of this show, on behalf of me, for whatever all of that is worth, and on behalf of my realized and unrealized privilege, I am sorry. I will do better, and I will learn. You know... They say that time heals all wounds, but I'm going to call bullshit on that. While it's true that time can heal wounds, it can also hide them. It can desensitize us to them. And then sometimes, sometimes, typically at the cost of a tragedy or several or hundreds and beyond, time finally does what it should have done all along and exposes the very wounds that we, the privileged, found it comfortable to pass off as healed, quipping that things were better or more equal when nothing could really be farther from the truth. So, like so many of you are asking, I'm left sitting here with this microphone, with this chair, saying, what can I do? Again, I've got a show, I've got a mic, I've got a platform, and I'm here to reconnect with an old friend turned beacon in the current landscape. You see, once upon a time, I had an incredible guest by the name of Chef Justin Sutherland on the show. He was, by all accounts, one of the most prolific restaurateurs in the Minneapolis area. Come what did, and given who he is, he took his voice to the masses and has stood up, spoke out, and done so in a way only someone with 16, I believe, I don't know, restaurants can do. It is with great honor and humility then, with no canned bullshit intro line to land, that I introduce and welcome back Chef Sutherland of Handsome Hog and so many others for a discussion that will be one might say, a bit atypical of the show. So, Chef, welcome back. Uh, I appreciate this more than you know. Wow, wow, Sean. Um, quite the intro, and, I mean, everything you said, it was just, uh, just hit so many uh, so many points. But, like like I said earlier in our conversation, I just, you know, we've become, we've become far, fast friends, and I appreciate your voice and your yeah. platform, and just thank you so much for having me back course man and, and 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 i mean those those words resonate and mean more you know to me now than ever just that 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 you know what you've got in us in the show and and, and in me so you know typically at this point we jump off and we talk about restaurants and food and upbringing and so on and and and, and, and i think rather than do that what i want to do is take the same kind of historical aspect to it But really help those listening who have not experienced anything like this. And again, you know, anybody like me has not. I don't care who's been your friend. I don't care where you went to school. You haven't experienced this. I'm wondering if we can start when you realized for yourself that, you know, race was more than just the percentage of melanin in your skin that it carried something like, was there a moment where you first identified that and went, Oh, you know, it's, it's funny that you say that. Um, and unfortunately, absolutely. And uh, the questions come up recently, Justin, do you remember your first experience, you know, with racism or anything like this? And, you know, I mean, to be, you know, to be honest, no, did I, did I grow up with an extremely oppressed life? No. I mean, I was in, you know, suburbs of Minnesota and I was, you know, I was doing well. I have a mixed race family, a grandmother from Japan, a grandfather from Norway, you know, a, an African American side. Um, but I vividly, vividly remember um, fourth grade being in YMCA after, you know, day, daycare uh, camp, you know, latchkey kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rang- you know, playing Same. basketball yep. and, you know, there was an older kid, you know, bullying around and 
the first time I, you know, I was probably a little more athletic, I'd like to think, and maybe blocked his shot. And it was the first time in my life I had heard the N word directed at me. And I knew that it was a bad word. I knew its history. Yeah. But, you know, being where I was from, being my family, I never really related that word to myself just because I didn't have those experiences, you know, at that time coming up to fourth grade. But I knew it was a horrible word and I knew where it came from. And, you know, this guy who was a couple years older than me turned to me and, you know, and said, you know, F and N word to me. And I just, without any prior experience, without even having had that related to me, just my blood started to boil. And it was the first time in my life I punched somebody in the face. Good for you. Oh Good my gosh, I, I revel in that old moments. And I remember, you know, the YMCA, you know, or, you know, the, the daycare lady, you know, grabbed, pulled me aside, comforted me because I'm bawling at this point. And, you know, I'm angry and I don't know why I'm angry, but I know that I should be angry and, and called my dad in and we sat down and she's like, you know, just so you know, uh, there's an altercation, Justin, you know, punched another kid in the face, but this is what was said. And, you know, bless his heart. I remember, you know, we, there, it was stern. Yes, you don't hit people but i remember going home and my dad saying good for you good good <laughs> and that was i mean i and I, I i forgot that moment for a while and as you know as tensions have risen re recently and i've been interviewed and asked you know similarly what my first experiences was i very much remember that and it's just it's, it's very interesting because it was like i said I knew the history of the word. I knew what it was meant, but it was the first time it was put in my direction. Yeah. And without any prior experience, it made me sad, hurt, and furious. And I, I had to knock this little fucking kid out. <laughs> Good for you, man. And I mean, I have to tell you that sitting in my chair now, now, I mean, this is not to say I was from, I was from small town America. You literally could count the number of African American students in my class on one hand. Like, that's where I came from. But I also grew up with a mother who was active, you know, during the Vietnam era, you know, in, in, in marches, in, 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 you know, civil rights and all this stuff. And so when I hear that, I think whether or not the landscape was going on, I mean, my blood was boiling for you just to hear you, you know, talk about that because it's, it's so, and I don't want to get off onto the parenting tangent. I know, you know, we've joked before about my three kids and your 16 restaurants. We kind of balance out, um, you know, with regards to um, stress levels. But, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where, you know, it's taught. It's not some inherent thing. You you, you know it's a taught thing. And so I, I wonder to look at, you know – how you knew it was a negative thing, I'm wondering where and how you learned that from. Was it from, you know, the parents, grandparents? Like, what, how did that come to you? And, you know, I have to, I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, we, we watched the movies, we watched The Color Purple growing up, you Great know, play. we watched Mississippi Burning. We knew, we knew the history, and especially growing up in the Midwest at the time, we knew the history. I mean, I was, you know, growing up in Apple Valley, I was one of seven you know, African Americans and five of us were mixed and we, we formed this little our little gang we called the OCC. It was the Oreo Cookie Clan. <laughs> <Jesus>. Okay. <laughs> and I, you know, and it was just like, you know, we banded together, but we also we were just immersed in this in this white culture, so we never you know, and then also I had, you know, my other half of the family that's you know, African American fully. Right. And there was just, you know, growing up there was just this disconnect that I knew these things were happening. I knew these things were horrible, but they weren't directly happening to me. Sure. But I found after time that they were, I just didn't really notice it. I didn't know the difference. You yeah. know, we, I yeah. didn't realize the, the difference between the way I was treated and, mm -hmm. you know, and the rest of the kids in school, because you just kind of blended in and did your thing. And then after that moment, I mean, this is, this, you know, this is fourth grade. Yeah. And then after that moment going forward, I really started to hone in on on the differences. And they became more and more apparent that shit wasn't fair. No. And so that's that's a really interesting point I, 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 I want to touch on. Just because, again, you and I both come from small towns. And, you know, it, oh, of course I didn't perceive it to be a thing. But I, I, do, does, small town, does a small town upbringing – almost insulate you i i know there's this common like hick mentality 
if we may be so bold to say, of a small town upbringing. And yet, does it maybe insulate you a little bit from it? I don't know. I think it, I think it insulates and I think it also normalizes, you know, that's you fair. Yeah. You don't see any, you know, you don't see anything different until it's, you know, until you get put in your face and then you're like, wow, this is, this is different. This isn't yeah. the same. Why is, why is this happening? And until it's in your face, you don't realize it. Yeah. 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 So, so, you begin to come into it. You begin to really identify it. Fourth grade, which, I mean, just seems inhumane. I'm, I'm going to just state for the record, my middle kid is coming out of fourth, going into fifth. And, like, he he cries when his video game doesn't work correctly. And I feel a little bit bad for him. To hear you say that that came into your view, into your focus, when you were in fourth grade there's there's a part of my humanity that just like aches for that and it's like i i like to think i i liked past tense to think that we're doing better as a society with our kids and 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 we're just not so you know i hate to you know keep it moving forward but if that was fourth grade you know talk to me about all the way up and through high school like you know with your increased awareness did it just kind of become more frequent to you? Did it become more severe to you? What happened? You know, I, I don't think, I don't know if the frequency uh, increased or decreased. I think on, on my side and, and, you know, the rest of us that grew up like this, I think the, the awareness was increased. Um, yeah. But we also, you know, it was, it was just at such a different time that yeah. it just unfortunately became normalized and we, we noticed it, but we became callous to it. And at the same time, there wasn't really an outlet to express any feelings about it. It just, this, you know, it just is what it was. It was what it was, yeah. And it, you know, it was just this passe situation to where in the back of our minds, we knew things were different. We knew we weren't treated the same, but who were you going to tell? What were you going to say? This just is what it was. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it, it's it's it, it's funny because in, in light of this and I know I, I caught you on the other night, you know, when I was jogging around this neighborhood where I don't live. And, you know, for those of you who haven't seen me in person, I'm not a small dude. I'm a big dude. And I look half homeless whenever I'm running because I hate it and I want to die when I'm doing it. But here I am in this neighborhood. I'm running around and nobody knows me from 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 Eve, from Adam. And. It, it, it's it struck me that you know for the for all the moments that I felt like things were maybe a little different, maybe a little better, and I'm gonna age myself here and say like you know late middle school, early high school was like the Spike Lee revolution where I felt like even in a small town we had some awareness, we had some dialogue, we had some discussion on it, and it felt like it was getting better, but it just continued at least as I felt to ebb and flow through college and so on. And so like, you know, that night I realized for as much as we ever thought it got better, it it never truly did. And so, you know, your awareness increases of it. And I, what I'd love to know is, do, do you feel like it ever like improved or has it just pretty much stayed the same with a different like coding on it? I I, I don't know how else to explain it. I'll be, and, and, you know, and this, I'll be very, I'll be very honest and frank, and, you know, this may seem, you know, to an extreme level, but I don't, I don't think it's ever improved. And no, that's fair. The, the reason that it hasn't improved is because, I mean, as, as a country, and I love America, I would not have the opportunities I've had without America. I mean, I don't, I'm, you know, far from anti anything American, but as a, As an idea, America has this long-standing debt that it's never paid. You know, we stole a country, then we stole people to build this country, then we, you know, put the then we built a system to keep those people who built this country down. And it's like, you know, there's just been this ever-building debt that has never, ever, ever been paid. 
No. And it's not even ever been acknowledged. It's just like we've washed we've washed this history away and pretend like it didn't happen. And now we've just hit this boiling point to with COVID hitting. And then, you know, it's not like these murders of African-Americans by police or anything new. They've happened every day for, for as long as we can remember. But this just boiling point happened. And it feels to me like the debt collector is banging on the door yeah, yeah. and he wants payment in full plus interest. And he's not leaving until we pay this debt or at least acknowledge that, hey, we did some fucked up shit. Yep. Yeah. And we owe it. Yeah. And, and like... I, I, I hate to say this. I hate to say this, but I can guarantee you there's people listening who are scratching their heads saying, who do we steal it from or who do we build it on the backs from? Let me give you the historic chronology. And by all means, please, Justin, feel free to jump in and correct me if I'm off. But my relatives, actually, the Native Americans, were the ones the nation was stolen from. The network of transport that the nation was built on would be the Chinese. And obviously, slavery enters, uh, I mean, from, I, I think U.S. wise, the slavery came over like late 1700s, correct? Like s right. some people pin it as early 1800s, but I'm like, yeah, no one, it, it, trust me, with those wigs, no one was carrying their shit. Like, no. you know, they, they, they brought over the practice with them and it's, you know, it's, and here's the funny thing is I understand it as a white person with enough native american to you know s say like hey look you know cool this is a part of my upbringing awesome right you know i it, as i understand i mean slavery as we know it we're looking back 1492 i, I believe there was still a slave trade when columbus first landed on this side I, i'm not certain of that but i mean i, I, I don't know even if we pin it as 400 years of people coming to this country with slaves, I would say there's a hell of a debt to be paid. Hell of a debt to be paid. That's I just mean, me. even, take, I mean, even if we take slavery out of it, even if there wasn't slavery, America owes a debt to Native Americans. America owes a debt to the Chinese that built our railroads, to the yep. Japanese we put in internment camps. Like We have continuously built this country off of the backs of other people without acknowledgement and i just think that's what's coming back to bite us in the ass right now because now there's a generation of people who recognize that and are saying enough is enough we're worn so thin at this point and i think even those of us who are white who are aware of it and who try to do right by it are worn thin too in our own very privileged way but I'm going to tell you, like, I'm just, I'm done with it. I laced into a lady at the store the other day who was running her socket about this, that, and the other thing. I'm like, you need to shut the hell up. Like, and I mean, excuse me? And she even had the Karen cut, so I felt really good about that. Um, I just I just had to lay into a Karen online yesterday and, you know, commented on a post saying, if, you know, if we would stop making everything about race... Uh, things would be better because racism doesn't exist. There's just bad Jesus people Christ. who do bad things. No, if you made everything about race and were honest about it and transparent about it, that would be the healing point. That would be where it starts. Then you leave it to the people who need the healing to actually say, okay, we're good. Like, it's it's not up to us. It's not up to us, the white, privileged masses. And I mean, that's what we are. And it's it, it, and that's true. And I mean, my you know, my I'm a quarter white. It's not you know, it's all that. But I mean, my biggest, I think right now, my biggest message to you know, just non people of color in this country is, I appreciate everybody's interest in wanting to ask questions and wanting to understand. I think there's a there's definitely a big awakening of people wanting to understand. But if you want to ask the question and you want to understand. Please ask, because I promise you there is not a person of color in this country or in this world that was not willing to tell you their story. But you have one job, one obligation, one responsibility after you ask that question, and that is to shut the fuck up and listen. Absolutely. S-T-F-U-A-L. And then, and then when you shut up and listen, I promise you you're going to feel really uncomfortable. And all we ask 
is that you live in that uncomfort and you relish in that uncomfortability and you understand what it's like to be uncomfortable. You understand what it's like to be followed around Target because they think you're going to steal something. You understand how uncomfortable it is to drive around a suburb with a flat-brimmed hat on because you think you're going to get pulled over because they think you're a thug. You have to understand how uncomfortable it is to walk up to a club or a music venue or a restaurant and see a dress code posted on the door that is specifically designed to keep you out. Like, be fucking uncomfortable because we are uncomfortable every day. I gotta, I, I, I gotta level with you, and I know, like, uh, like, honest to God, we are gonna hang out, we're gonna crack some whiskey, and we're gonna cook some good fucking food someday. I have to be as level and honest with you. In 132 episodes, this was the most nervous I've been. I've talked to Chris Kimball, I've talked to Ming Tsai, I've talked to um, Stephen Reichlin. This was the most nervous for an interview I've been, and it wasn't nervous out of oh hey, it's who I'm talking to. It's, man, if you ever have to be on point and shut your mouth, it's tonight. And and that's, that's honestly, that's leveled out of respect. I'm not saying that to get like, oh, oh I'm kissing Justin Sutherland's ass. Trust me. You know, if I want some whiskey, I, I'm going to hit you up. But like, Hell yeah. Yeah, but. Well, and, I'll, and I'll send you some. I love it. I love it. But I mean, really, truly, and honestly, I think that's the white cotton gloves like in an antique museum i'm carrying this topic with and i think those of my similar uh, melanin concentration would do well to entertain in a similar fashion because that's where we're at that's where the country's at and so um justin without you know just just you know dragging it you know out what what are like if you had to name the top three things aside from you know STFUAL, you know which I I, I think you should get that on a shirt. Honestly, right. I'm gonna throw that out there. There you go. Um, and uh, shit, I'll run with it if you want. What are three other things? Three other things, just to name them, that we in the white privileged community can do to help increase awareness, to help you know decrease the the discomfort you experience on a daily basis what can we do i mean you know and i mean not to beat it to death i mean it, it just starts with listening and you know listening i mean it's just being an ally i mean i don't we don't nobody expects you to understand to have a frame of reference to even get it in fact i i, I hope you don't get it because i wouldn't wish the Native American, African American, African American, you know, Hispanic American. I would not wish the experience of anybody who's not white in America on anybody. So I understand that you don't get it, and that's a beautiful thing. You are lucky. Just shut up and stop making excuses and stop taking things so personally. Just because we are uncomfortable driving our car through the suburbs of Edina doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means we've had a bad experience in this country. So just be an ally. That's great. And just great. listen. Like, it's not, I think, and I think some of that, that white uncomfortability and guilt just comes from, yes, it's, I, I get it, it's uncomfortable. And then you start feeling bad about yourself. You don't have to feel bad about yourself to be an ally for somebody else. I stand up for, you know, any, you know, the LGBTQ community. It doesn't, I don't feel bad about myself when, you know, people in the gay community are, you know, are oppressed. Yeah. I just want to be an ally for them. That's a great point. That, that, you know, because I think that's, if there's one thing the centrists and potentially slightly right-leaning folk lean on, it's the fact that, Oh, well, why, why should I feel guilty about something my grandparents did? I don't, that's not what you're asking, correct? Correct. All, all we're asking is, and, and if you don't want to listen, and if you don't want to listen, feel free to not ask the question. Exactly. Just, you know, you don't have to ask. If you do ask, your job is to shut up and listen. If you don't want to ask, your job is still just to shut up. Yeah. And just stop, yeah. you know, your opinion, it does not valid in this situation. Because so it, just understand you're not a part of this oppressed community, and just because you don't understand it doesn't make it not true. 
Exactly, exactly. And listen, fair warning, I, and I'm going to tell you, there's like a small militia of people with this cool CGPC shirt on. They're listeners to the show. Um, you, we're out there, and several Mike li- like-minded folks are out there. Like, your time of shooting your mouth off, even in small-town America, is done. Right. I think there's more, and like, I love this. That more than ever, my fellow white privileged folk are not just speaking up, but I mean barking and snapping at it. And I love it because that's what the response should have been all along. And that's how you, and that's how you know that us as a country have hit a breaking point. When uh, Bethany, who went to Harvard, who is wearing her Birkenstocks, is out there holding a Black Lives Matter poster, yeah. we know that we've had enough. She's like, oh, my God, guys, Black Lives Matter. Um, I, I, which, no, actually, which, she's which, a Harvard. Which is, which, is, which is beautiful. And all, <laughs> please, please keep. I mean, we need all of you. But exactly. that's how you know that enough is enough. Well, that's the thing, too. And, you know, people are quick. And, again, they're especially centrist to right-leaning. Real quick to shit on, oh, these privileged white girls from – or these privileged white boys from Cornell or blah, blah, blah. No, dude. Like, they're holding the sign. They're following the message. Like, they're getting it. They're tuning in more than ever before. What that echoes to me as is it's just insecurity. Like, it's just, oh, my God, this thing we used to hang our hat on for, like, 200, 300 years is about to fall off the wall. What do we do? And that's why why we're changing our message. I mean, we're not looking for white guilt. We're looking for white allyship. Yep. Just be an ally. Don't feel bad. Nobody's saying that because... Because your grandparents, your great grandparents were shitty that you're shitty. Yeah. You're, you're probably great. Yeah. Just be an ally. Be quiet. Listen. If you don't understand, ask questions. Yep. And if you have more questions, ask again. Cause I promise you, we will tell you the story. My grandfather was a drunk Native American who used to drink blackberry brandy to fight off the flu. So he was pretty cool. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of them. I don't know about the rest of them, right. but so I mean. But anyway, we don't need you know, not to get not to get too heavy on your uh, lighthearted food show. But. Yeah, lighthearted, lighthearted food show. <laughs> but no, I, I, you know, to to kind of put a nice bow on it, you know, I know this is heavy, and I hope everybody, you know, stuck with us to this point because, God damn, it, you know, it's an important message. And when, when I saw you speaking out to the masses in the city that has been so, you know good to you from a restaurant perspective i thought you want to talk about using your powers for good this guy just wrote the book on it truly wrote the book on it um there's a um there's a picture out there of you with the mic in your hand there's a picture of you from the back with your fist in the air i'm like this is like like you're you're killing it there man you're literally putting it out there and you're doing what everyone with a voice should do. And I mean, I guess I have a voice, whatever. You know, my mom it's, listens. So it's not it's not all been good, John. I mean I Yeah. I mean every day I for every you know, for every thumbs up I get, I lose fifty followers. And, you know, that's at this point where I mean, you know, we us as, you know, whatever leaders we are in our individual fields, you know, I I'm I don't need or want to make everybody happy. Right now good for you, we've man. Reached, we've reached level fuck it. And you're either with us or you're not. <laughs> yeah, dude. I mean, it's just, it's such a breaking point, you know? And I think, you know, for as much as people want to, you know, trash Trump, I still do. But, like, thanks for bringing us to this point because we're sick of your shit and everybody like right. you. So, <laughs> yep. there you go, dummy. Um, so, that's that's just incredible. And you know what? I hope those followers continue to fall off because there's only going to be times 10 that follow behind and go, oh, wow. Remember Justin Sutherland? And Chef will be second place to activist. And it, it was always supposed to be. So, you know, Chef has always been a vehicle for me to do the things that I that I care about. And, you know, it happened to come through food. If it wasn't food, it would have come through something else. Um, you know, I just That's I just right. ended up being good with a knife in my hand and a saute in the other. But either way, my message was going to be the same. Better, better than you even know, dude. And just to... You know, wrap things up here as far as the episode goes. Handsome Hog is reopening. Is that correct? Tomorrow, 3 p.m. After, after four months in the dark, reopening in a new location. We're going from 66 to 300 seats. Wow. 
Wow, that's that's a big increase, man. Um, yeah. So, and that's tomorrow at three. Jesus, and I'm, here I am keeping you up late. What am I doing? Uh, that's all right. This was no you kidding me. Ne- needed this more, and uh, no, we've uh, we've been cracking at it all day. Just did our food tasting and a little media preview, and we're ready to go. So I'm I'm very excited to, you know, keep keep fighting the fight, but also uh, keep cooking some food. That's right, man. Hey, I cannot thank you enough. And, uh, you know, on behalf of the listeners, on behalf of everybody who has heard your voice, man, thank you. You are truly one of the best ever. And it is an honor and a privilege to call you a friend. Thank you, Sean. That really means a lot, man. Uh, yeah, anytime. And uh, you still owe me a trip to Minnesota. We're still going to cook together. I still got to cook for you. But thank you for, you know, being an ally, uh, being a Absolutely. voice and, and being a friend, brother. No question. No question, my man. Ladies and gentlemen. This has been episode number 132 of the Course Round Podcast with Chef Justin Sutherland, chef and just freaking icon, freaking awesome dude, um, out there doing his stuff. Uh, be sure to check out Handsome Hog as it reopen tomorrow at 3, no less. Um, if you're out in the area, our producer, as always this evening, has been the Reverend Johnny Lamoria. Be sure to check out all his libertarian happenings in the Dale of Hones. And next episode will be number 133. Stay tuned.